everyone, thank you so much for joining us online, worshiping at Park City's Baptist Church this week. I know that this is maybe not the way we would have chosen to do this months ago, but I am so thankful for the resources and the talents that we have at our church to make worship online possible. So thank you for sticking with it. Faithfulness is such a huge mark of growing in Christ. So thank you for being faithful. I know this has been a difficult season for all of us. And one of the things that I find most difficult as we've walked through this season is knowing how to grow in my relationship with Christ. Sometimes it can feel easy. Sometimes it can feel really difficult. But a lot of the times for me, it feels like I'm solving a riddle that I don't know the answer to. And if you've ever had somebody ask you a riddle, it feels like when you don't know the answer, it feels really complicated. And then when they reveal the answer to you, you're like, oh yeah, that totally makes sense. For instance, I saw a riddle this week uh, that, that's the riddle of the Sphinx. And I'll ask it to you now. What goes on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? Do you know it? Ask the person next to you, see if they know it. The answer is a human being. And I've drawn a, a, a graphic over here for you to show you. Please forgive my terrible drawing. A baby is a human being and it grows on four legs in the morning. A man, an adult, goes on two legs in the afternoon in the middle of life. And then we have an older adult that goes on three legs. They're walking on a cane. Now, I know that my older adult looks like he's on putting on the Ritz, going to the club, but this is the best that I can possibly do for you drawing. So the answer to the riddle is a human being. A human being is the answer to the Sphinx's riddle. It's the riddle of the Sphinx is what that's called. And so what I want us to talk about today as we walk through this series on identity, finding our identity in Jesus Christ, is I want us to look and use this riddle as a graphic, as an illustration for learning how to grow in Christ and maybe solve the riddle of how to do that in our own lives. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 12 to 14. And in doing that, we're going to look and see how we might grow more and more into the image of Christ. The first stage that we're going to look at is this one. It's the baby, it's the infant. And so I want you to have faith like a child. Have faith like a child. One of the most important things that a child needs in its development is something dependable. My wife and I had this conversation recently. Children thrive in environments that they know what the expectations are, things that they can depend on without a lot of instability. It's why trauma in early years can just create such havoc in a person's life. And so we need to have dependability in our relationships with our parents. And in the same way, you need to have dependability in your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, you are right here. You're a child of God. You are a child of his. And that means there are things that you can depend on, things that you can rely on in your relationship with him. And you need that dependability so that you can grow in him. Now, depending on how you read this passage, you might say that there are three stages or, or uh, two stages. I think there's actually three in this passage. Let's take a look real quick at the passage and see the two things that as a child of God, I get to enjoy in my relationship with him. Verse 12, I am writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I write to you children in the end of verse 13 because you know the father. John gives us two things that we get to enjoy. The first one is we get to enjoy forgiveness. We get to enjoy forgiveness. I make mistakes, we all make mistakes. And sin has separated us from God. Sin has put us at a distance from him. And there's nothing I can do to fix that. But what God does is he sends his son on the cross to die for our sins and to die for your sins and to die for my sins so that I have a relationship with him now. And if you have faith, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can have that relationship with him as well, which is so incredibly amazing because I don't have to do anything but put my trust in him. I can just rely wholly on him. And a lot of us in the Christian world think this is just a one-time commitment. It's a one-time commitment. I'm, I believe one time and now I'm good to go. No, no, no. This is foundational to your growth in Christ. This is foundational. You have to go back to that well of forgiveness again and again. We need to daily, regularly experience the forgiveness of God in our lives. So to remember the forgiveness of God, I wanna use our illustration, and I've got a sweet Paw Patrol Band-Aid here that my daughter let me borrow, and we're gonna put it right here. As a child of God, I get to enjoy forgiveness. John says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
That's such an amazing truth. Who wants to be close to a God that's gonna hold our sins over us? Who wants to be close to a God that's gonna remind us every time we interact with him what a failure we are? That's not what God wants for you. That's not what God wants in a relationship with you. And that's why as children of God, we have to go back to that forgiveness again and again and again. I hope that you know that you have the forgiveness of God if you believe and trust in Jesus Christ. That's something open to you. And that forgiveness allows us to experience another gift, another part of the joy of being a child of God. And that's what we get to enjoy God's love. So I'm gonna draw a heart. We get to enjoy God's love here. John says that he's writing to them in verse 13, I write to you children because you know the Father. Knowing the Father means that that you draw close to him, you have experience with him. It's not an intellectual knowledge, although that's part of it. It's an experiential knowledge. It's getting to know him personally on a daily, regular basis. And what's more amazing than that is God knows us. God knows us. He knows us and he loves us. It's one thing to be known. I think many of us think we're known and if people really know who we are, they're not gonna love us. And then some people think, People love me, but they don't really know me. God does both. He knows you intimately well, and he loves you just the same. Now, he doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He wants you to grow just like a good parent wants a child to grow, but he loves you just the same. He gives us hope. He gives us joy. He gives us all these gifts so they might grow more and more like him. You need to strengthen your relationship with God. You need to grow more in love with God every single day. You need to do this regularly. Look, I know this is a difficult time and it's a time of great uncertainty. Some of you are are missing out on life experiences. Some of you have pushed your wedding back or even canceled it for the time being because you don't know when you're gonna be able to have the wedding of your dreams. And so you're missing out on that experience. Some of you are missing out on graduations. Some of you have loved ones that have passed away and you're waiting to do a funeral. And so there's nothing you can depend on. These ceremonies, these rhythms of life that we're used to that mark the seasons of life are removed from us and it's undependable. Some of you are business leaders and you've had to lay off or furlough people that work for you, and you feel like such a failure. Because you're like, if I was better at business, I would be doing a better job of keeping my employees. Or maybe you're somebody that was furloughed. You were told you were non-essential. All of us need something that we can depend on. And the things that you can depend on as a child of God, you can depend on his love and you can depend on his forgiveness. And we can go back to that again and again and again. And it doesn't matter where you're at or what you're experiencing, you're always going to be his child. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, remember here it says in verse 12, because your, your, your sins are forgiven for his name's sake, for the name of Jesus Christ, not because of anything you've done, not because of any success you've had, not because you're rocking it at home, doing the homeschooling thing, or because you're terrible at homeschooling your kids right now. It doesn't matter. It's based on his name's sake, on his person and his work. And so as a child of God, His forgiveness and his love are available to you. But our father's a great parent and he wants us to continue to grow and he wants us to grow up to be strong adults. And so we're gonna move on here to right here and he wants us to fight. So he wants us to have faith like a child, but he wants us to fight like a man. Look back at the passage and look at the end of verse 14. It says, I write to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the evil one. Now I know that when this was written, John is writing to a more patriarchal society. So it's easy to read this passage and say, oh, they're saying young men, next he's gonna say fathers. Does this apply to me as a woman? Of course it does. I think if John's writing today, it's much more inclusive language. But in the same way that people use the word mankind and refer to all humanity, John is writing to groups of people and using the masculine term as representative for the entire mixed gender group. So I hope that you know that this applies to you ladies. This applies to you just as much as it applies to men. Now you're probably familiar with the idiom, fight like a man. What it means is to fight with honor, to fight with dignity, to not gang up on somebody, to not do low blows, to not do anything like that, but to fight face to face, man to man. As that expression is is another one we have. So what John is saying here is he wants them to fight a certain way. He's applauding them because of the way that they are conducting themselves, the way they are fighting. So I wanna talk about, using our little guy here, I want us to talk about how we can fight like a man, but I don't want us to to fight like a man. I want us to change that idiom a little bit because we don't wanna fight like a man. We wanna fight like the man. We wanna fight like Jesus Christ. 
He is our model. He is the person we're trying to imitate. He's the person we're trying to become more like. So when I tell you to fight like a man, let's change that. Let's fight like the man. And really scripture, he gives us three things here that we can do to fight like the man. First thing he says is to fight with strength. Notice what it says in verse 14. I write to you young men because you are strong. So what I'm gonna draw here is I'm gonna draw something. Whoops. It's gonna be a shield. If you're gonna draw a shield, you wanna be strong. You, to carry a shield, you have to have strong, good arm strength. So John is telling them you're strong. And a shield is meant for defense. It's meant to, to hold off the attacks of the enemy, right? To have a shield means you are protecting yourself. You need to be strong. Now, part of being strong in Christ is acknowledging that you can't do it all, that you are actually weak, that you need his strength to hold you up. You need his strength to grow you more and more into his image. I want you to think about this. A good soldier, when you see a soldier armored up, uh, you don't think that a soldier armored up is weak, do you? No, you think they're strong. If you look at your body, go ahead and you can take this. You can look at your body and just kind of feel around. Notice how soft you are. Our bodies are incredibly susceptible to puncture wounds like swords, spears. Our bodies are susceptible to bullets, guns. And it would be a foolish person who would see an army of people with guns or spears or swords and be like, I'm okay, I can handle that. No, what they do is they put on armor. They recognize their weakness and they put on armor to protect their vital organs, knowing that our flesh is weak. In the same way, you are foolish. If you go into battling sin in your life, battling uh, trials in your life, battling difficulty in your life and saying, I got it, I can handle this. No, no, no. If we're gonna grow up to be soldiers of Christ, we're gonna grow up and become mature in Christ. We have to conquer our sin. We have to push the sin back in our life. We have to give it no quarter. We have to fight hard against it. And to do that, we have to acknowledge that we can't really do that. We have to do it in the strength of Christ. He has to be our strength. That's why they are strong. We need to be strong in Christ. So he applauds them and he wants them to fight with strength, but he also wants them to fight with weapons. Notice this, I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. He says the word of God abides in you. What this means is that it's not just that they know the word of God and it's not just that they read the word of God and they memorized it, it's that they live according to the word of God. The word of God remains in them. In fact, the best way I can do it, say it is, it is basically the way that they live is the way of Jesus Christ. They are imitating him. So I want us to think of the word of God. Sometimes it's referred to as the sword of the spirit, but I want us to use this picture. We're gonna use a spear. And the reason why we're using a spear is two reasons. One, it's gonna help my illustration, and two, it's much easier to draw than a sword. And so clearly I'm not the best artist in the world. So what we wanna do is we wanna think of it as a spear. And it, to imitate Jesus Christ, we need to do three things. Jesus Christ was marked by three things. He sacrificed for the kingdom of God, he sacrificed for the love and the good of other people. And he prayed urgently and, uh, and steadfastly for the patience and the endurance to make it through it. And this is what we need to do. We need to be willing to sacrifice for the kingdom. We need to be willing to, to go shoulder to shoulder with other believers. And we need to be willing to pray for the endurance to stick through those things because they're very difficult. So let's walk through this. Let's talk about what this looks like. One, taking up the cross, taking up the spear for the kingdom. We need to be thinking beyond just how life affects us. And we need to begin to think about how life affects the community of faith. Let me ask you this. This whole crisis has been going on for a couple months in our society, even longer globally. How many times in your prayers have you thought about how this is affecting the church? And I don't mean just Park Cities. I mean the church at large, capital C Church. How many times have you prayed for believers on other continents and other parts of the world, for other churches? How often have you thought of them and remembered them in your prayers? There's some pastors who are churches in, in third world countries and recovering countries that, that are worried that their congregation is gonna get this virus and they'll just lose their congregation through death and illness. There's some churches that are closing their doors because they don't have the resources to stay open. We need to think beyond the walls of our homes. We need to think beyond the walls of our lives and our friends group. And we need to begin to think about the global church and how life is affecting them, not just in the middle of a pandemic, but at all times, we need to remember, just if you want, go find a globe or a map, spin it, put your finger on it and say, I'm going to pray for churches in this country, wherever that might be. If you put your finger in the Pacific Ocean, spin again. Uh, that doesn't count. Uh, maybe pick a small country, island country somewhere. But we want to pray for the church throughout the world. One of the things I'm proudest about, Park City's Baptist Church right now, is that 
the resources that you're giving to Park Cities aren't just going to Park Cities things. You're not just using it to pay staff. We're not just using it to, to film worship services and stuff like that. We are using it to help churches that are in need. We're a part of a collection of churches in the Dallas Baptist Association who are giving to churches in our city. We're giving to churches in our state. We're giving to churches in our nation to help them stay open during this time. That's, that's probably the thing I am most proudest of with our church right now and the way that we're handling that and being a global church, not just focused on our own needs and our own desires. Make that a part of your life too. And know that when you give, you're putting your eye towards the global community. So we wanna sacrifice for the kingdom. We also want to sacrifice and suffer with other believers. Uh, I don't know how much you know about ancient history, but the Greek soldier was called a hoplite. And the Greek soldier was equipped with a shield and a spear. Now, on his own, the Greek soldier with the sword and or the shield and the spear was dangerous, but not terrifying. He could be beaten. But what they did was they put these Greek soldiers together and they called it a phalanx. And basically they turned them into a wall of spears, spears all facing one direction. And each person was covered up by the shield of the person to their right. When you study the word of God, when you are using the spear, yeah, you might be dangerous. You might be dangerous to the enemy. You might be able to tackle your sin a little bit and restrict it in your own life. Yeah, maybe. But you become absolutely lethal to evil in this world when you unite with other believers, when you get in a phalanx of believers and all the spears, all the, the, the collective knowledge of the word of God, the work of the spirit in our lives are all pointed in one direction. We become unbeatable as the spirit of God moves in us. So I know this is a difficult time to gather with other people, but I know some of us have Zoom fatigue. I was in a conversation this week where people were like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired of staring at a screen. I'm tired of be meeting with people over a screen. Don't give up on meeting with other believers if you're doing it via a screen. Keep going. Be a part of that wall of spears, of believers that are tackling evil, fighting sin in your own life. Another thing about our weapon is it takes patience to use it. And that's why Jesus, I think, prays in the Garden of Gethsemane for patience, for endurance. He prays that God would give him the courage to keep going even though he doesn't really want to go through with it. I think this is a powerful thing for us because we think we have to hold up this like false holiness. No, we need to acknowledge that this is hard. This is difficult. And we need to pray for patience. The word of God is, the, is a patient weapon. A lot of us like to treat it like, a, like we're just hacking and slashing. We just open it up. We look for a Bible verse. And we're like, oh, that's going to be me today. And then when it doesn't work, we're like, well, I, I, I don't have faith in the word of God anymore. No, 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 no. We immerse ourselves in scripture. We learn how to study it. We learn how to read it. We become proficient in the use of this weapon. And then, then we're patient when using it. We look for openings. We look for times when a verse might apply. We meditate on it. We marinate on it. We become experts in it. So be patient. And remember, the more and more you use the word of God, the more and more you use the weapon that God has given us, the more deadly it is to the enemy and the causes of evil. So we wanna have the weapon. We wanna be proficient in weapon use. And then John notifies them that there's one more thing that he's proud of them about. He says, I write to you young men, and you skip down, it says, and you have overcome the evil one. So what I wanna do is, what we have here is the Nike swoosh. Now the Nike swoosh, the reason why there's a Nike swoosh is because uh, uh, the word here for overcome is Nike. It's a Greek word that means Nike, it means victory. It means, that, so that's where Nike gets their, their logo and their name from. Just do it is victory. They're, they're telling us to have victory. God wants you to have victory. He wants you to win. He wants you to defeat the sin in your life. And so many of us have sin in our life that we're struggling with that, that keeps cropping up. And what many of us have done, rather than overcoming the sin that trips us up in our life, we've kind of just made a peace treaty with it. We've made a non-aggression pact with it. We limit it to a certain time of day. We learn to limit it to a certain group of friends that we're with. And we've kind of just let it live on in our life. We need to be ruthless with our sin. You need to be willing, and this is kind of a graphic image, but to stomp on the throat of your sin. You need to be ruthless with your sin, like throwing 40 yard bombs in a 50 up, when you're up 50 up in a football game, ruthless. Like never stopping. One of the great things that Alcoholics Anonymous has taught us is that if something has gotten your goat once, if something has been an addiction before, it can continue to be an addiction. It can crop up at the strangest times. A lot of us think we've defeated our sin when really our sin's just sleeping. Don't be lulled to sleep by a, by a false sense of security. Don't let your sin play possum on you. Put it to death. Keep fighting against it and overcome. 
and overcome in Jesus Christ. That's the key. You have to be victorious in Christ. You can't just white knuckle it. You have to do this through the power of Christ and the power of the Spirit. And that's why it's important to be in this word. It's why it's important to be in community. It's why it's important to pray for endurance and patience. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, wow, this growing in Christ seems really difficult. It seems like a fight. It seems really hard. What's the benefit? What am I looking forward to? And that's the last thing. We want to be firm like an elder. We want to be firm like an elder. Be firm like an elder. John goes on to write, and he repeats himself twice. He writes in verse 13, I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And again, in verse 14, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. One of the things that I love about older adults is that they are so stable. They're so stable. When difficult times come, they're like, I've been through this before. We'll get through it. There's difficult things going on. I'll get through it. We've gotten through worse. They seem so unflappable. John is writing to the elders of this church. And he's saying, I'm writing to you because you guys know him who is from the beginning. The him is Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things that we believe about Jesus is that his life didn't start when he was born of a Virgin Mary. We believe that the Son of God is preexistent, that he was before all things, that all things were created through him and for him. And because we believe that, we know that he has control, sovereignty. He's in charge of everything. And that's one of the marks of a, of a mature, growing uh, 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 adult believer is you don't just hold Jesus Christ as Savior, as a good friend, as somebody who just forgives you and loves you, even though that's really important. We hold on to him as sovereign and Lord. He's not just my buddy. He's not just my Savior. He's my Lord. He's my King. He's in charge, and I trust him. And what this does for you as a believer is it makes you stable and secure. So what I'm going to draw over here are two things to remind us of stability and security. got a peace sign for stability and a lock for security. People who are mature in their faith, no matter what comes their way, good things, bad things, difficult things, it may cause worry, it may cause anxiety, it may cause challenge, but they're going to stay like this. They're going to walk just like this. They're going to be stable and secure. It's not just that we need to have faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. He needs to be our Lord. We need to trust him with everything that we have so that we might be stable and secure. And that's really the pinnacle. That's, that's where we're all headed. The more and more we become like Jesus Christ, the more and more we become stable and secure. And then the people around us, they get to enjoy that stability and that security as well. And we get to help those who are behind us, the children in the faith, the young adults in the faith. We get to help them in their battles. We get to help them in their difficulties. We get to remind them of the love and forgiveness that they have in Christ. So what's the answer to the riddle of growing in Christ? I would say it's these basic things. We're all children of God. And so we all get to enjoy forgiveness and love. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you get to enjoy the forgiveness and love of God. If you're not, that's open to you today. You can put your faith in Christ today. And what that means is it's like wholesale, I'm just putting all of my eggs in the basket of Jesus Christ. Whatever junk I'm going through, I'm trusting him with it because of his death, burial, and resurrection. And that's salvation. You're a Christian now. And all of us have this, no matter what stage we're in, we can always go back to this. But then the next thing we need to do is we need to be willing to fight. We need to fight against the sin in our life, fight against the difficulty in our life, fight against the things that so easily trip us up. We need to be strong. We need to learn how to use the weapon and we need to overcome. We need to have victory. And then eventually over time, and it does take time. One of the things that I've learned uh, is that growing old and growing old in my faith really just take time. You're not going to go from a 35 year old to an 85 year old overnight. It takes time. You're not going to go from a young Christian to an old Christian, a mature Christian overnight. It takes time. But we're looking to be stable and we're looking to be secure. And if this has been a season in your life where you've just been sent into a tailspin, you don't feel stable and you don't feel secure, that might be a good indication, a good indication that you're maybe not as far along as you thought. So let's look to the Lord. Let's, let's seek forgiveness and growth together as we grow more and more into the image of Christ. So I hope that helps you solve the riddle of how to grow more and more into the image of Christ, because sometimes it's hard. But we're here for you, we wanna be here for you as a church, and I'd love to pray for you right now as you start the next step in this journey of growing more and more like Christ. Father God, we thank you so much for the great, great grace that you have poured out into our lives. We thank you that we have hope, 
that we have forgiveness, that we have your love, and that that's available to us at all times. Lord, I pray that you would continue to grow us up more into the image of your son, that not only may we come to know you better, but may we become to, to look beyond ourselves and look around at the ways that we can fight against evil, fight against sin in our life, and take up the spear, take up the shield, and have victory. And I pray that Park City's Baptist Church and the church in Dallas and the church in the world would become stable and secure and be a refuge for people looking for that because they haven't just found the church, they found Jesus Christ. So Lord God, we love you. Pray that you would end this virus. Pray that you would rescue us and pray that you would continue to remind us how much you love us. And it's in your son's great name we pray, amen. Hey, if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you don't even know where to start, maybe it still seems like a riddle to you, you can text the name Jesus to the number that you see on your screen and there'll be someone that'll get back to you. They'll talk to you and walk you through the process based on your life and how you might come to know Jesus Christ and start walking with him today.